uh, so the point of uh, uh, of making this uh, presentation for the Bulgarian Innovation Hub is to introduce the question uh, because the topic of today's uh, uh, workshop actually emerged during one of our co-innovation workshops, uh, which we had as part of the um, Agroecology Transact project, where we were discussing various uh, topics, issues, um, needs for the development uh, in the Innovation Hub. Uh, so what is the situation in the Bulgarian uh, Western Startup Planning Innovation Hub? It is situated in the northwestern uh, part of Bulgaria, covering five municipalities, and it is at the border of uh, uh, Bulgaria and uh, Serbia. Its exceptional uh, biodiversity is reflected in the uh, number of protected areas that are there. There are several Natura 2000 sites and also an ongoing discussion for a cross-border uh, nature park together with Serbia. So, uh, the biodiversity is uh, to a large extent in the forest, so 50% is forest in the region, but the other 50% is agricultural land, and this agricultural land is dominated by uh, grasslands and pastures. Uh, on the grasslands and pastures, we have extensive grazing of sheep, but also of sakla cows, and also dairy cattle. And the biodiversity is both in the plant species, but also butterflies, birds. And this diversity of farming systems in Western Stara Planina also leads to a diversity of food products that farmers still produce. So we have uh, uh, white cheese, yogurt, uh, kashkaval with herbs from the region and also wild fruits from the region and different meat products coming from the region. Uh, and uh, they're being marketed uh, to a large extent in Sofia, but also in the uh, nearby big uh, cities. Our challenge in this case was uh, how to communicate the biodiversity value of uh, grasslands and the extensive grazing in the quality of the food product. So there is an existing common sense knowledge where everybody in the communication and marketing activity for the health of the animals but how this common knowledge is supported by scientific evidence is the thing that was raised in our innovation hub and uh, sorry, Yanka. sorry uh we can't see your presentation you're not in presenter mode uh, i think you should ah uh, god um so i yeah. was only yeah i ran for the presentation but you didn't see it so is it now in presentation mode no i think you have to click at the uh, bottom on the yeah, yeah i click on the bottom oh. but uh, it's uh mm, okay so uh, i will just do it by hand it's here. fine yeah yeah <laughs> i will just do it from here so this is the location of western Stara planina uh, our region and uh, the green areas here are the grasslands for which I was talking about. And here are the photos that you didn't see from uh, the sheep grazing, but also the sakla cow grazing and the dairy cow, uh, dairy cattle grazing, the biodiversity of plants and butterflies, the birds, storks, cracks, cracks, others, the, the products, the food products, and then the question that is the basis for today's event, and I'm sorry for the presentation that you didn't see it while I was talking, but I still hope that the topic was uh, uh, introduced. And this is very, very shortly for the three minutes that I have for the presentation. Thank you very much. So over to you. Okay. So um, welcome also from my part and thank you for joining. I'm Julie from the Swiss Innovation Hub AGFF. AGFF, the Swiss Grassland Society, is a national organization governed by a joint body of farmers, advisor, representative of industry, association and agricultural research institute. It represents interest to achieve high quality forage and sustainable site adapted grassland management 
optimizing ecosystem services and multifunctionality in grassland. Within the agroecology transect project, the AGFF focuses on the further development of the multi-species mixture system for grass clover lays and permanent grassland. So today I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Florian Leiber from FIBEL. FIBEL is a leading institution in organic farming research and training based in Freak, uh, Switzerland. Dr. Leiber is an expert in animal nutrition and is currently co-head of the Department of Livestock Science and co-leader of the Animal Nutrition Group at FIBEL Switzerland. For many years, his research has focused on grassland-based nutrition for ruminant, which is a very relevant issue for Switzerland, which has around 80% of its agricultural land covered by grassland. The topic of today's lecture is the special quality of milk and meat from grass-feed livestock. Claims about the health benefit of certain foods seems to be everywhere. Dr. Leiber's presentation will shed light on claims about the health benefit of grass-fed milk and meat and will be of interest to both consumer and farmer. The basis of his talk is the relationship between botanical diversity, the biochemical diversity of feed, and the resultant value for animal and human health. Such one health ID may emerge when considering the multifunctionality effect of feed interaction in grazing ruminants. This concept can be well linked to some aspect and principle of agroecology, such as achieving integrated animal health and welfare, promoting synergism in terms of positive ecological interaction, and also the principle of social value and diets with a food system built to provide healthy, diversified, culturally appropriate diets, to name but a few. So I'm going to hand it over to Florian. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, um, Lucy, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and I, I kindly ask you to interrupt me immediately if uh, you lose um, my speech or my slides, because I am only 97% sure that my connection is stable. Um, and yes, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, hello to everybody. I'm happy to see some uh, uh, common names um, uh, in the in the list of participants here today. I also was happy to hear something about Stara Planina because I had the luck to be there um, last season and the season before. Um, so um, this was a nice uh, surprise for the beginning. And um, I will try to start my speech um, by sharing my screen. And Again, I hope it is as I want. So you see my screen and I start. So I was asked to talk about the quality of dairy and meat products from grazing ruminant systems. And this is a topic I indeed uh, worked quite a lot on many years ago and still, but um, currently I'm more um, in like administrative uh, uh, tasks, and um, I'm, I was happy to have the opportunity to go into this topic uh, once more in some detail. I want to start um, with um, a statement, and my statement is uh, that yes, grass-based ruminant products are healthier um, than ruminant products that are produ produced um, on other resources than grass or on high percentages of other resources than grass. And um, uh, to start, I will um, show you the results of one paper of a meta-analysis. It's not my paper. Um, it is actually, it was a paper from the UK. It's a few years old. And 
this paper compared organic and conventional dairy products from uh, uh, around 170 published studies. And um, they looked at quality differences between organic and conventional. And um, okay, you may think now that I want to advertise um, the organic principles here and the, the organic products, um, but this is not. I want to, uh, with this paper, I want to um, show you the main um, known and common differences uh, between grass-based products and not grass-based products. So um, they looked at fatty acids in the first, uh, as the main and first question, because fatty acid profiles are probably the most, um, uh, the most pronounced topic where we can find differences. And you see here um, outcome of their analysis, um, uh, a lot of different fatty acids. I will go into the details right now. And you see um, at, on the picture that every, um, every parameter which is on the right-hand side of the picture would be an advantage of the organic-based products. And every um, uh, issue on the left-hand side of the picture would be an advantage of the conventional. And um, the first line we have here is the milk yield, which is not surprising and a clear advantage for the conventional farm and uh, the conventional um, dairy products. If we look within all these fatty acids at the omega-3 fatty acids, the most famous healthy fatty acids, um, um, then we see for many of them, a rather clear advantage of the organic products. And most prominently, ALA, which is here. This is the alpha linolenic acid, which is the basic omega-3 fatty acid produced uh, during the processes of photosynthesis in the green tissues of plants and provided by plants to all us animals. And all the other longer chain um, omega-3 fatty acids that follow here are um, in plants in small amounts. And we, uh, by some degree, are all able to derive these long chain omega-3 fatty acids from the alpha-linolenic acid. But if we don't get alpha-linolenic acid, we as mammal animals have no omega-3 fatty acids at all. And here we see for this group of fatty acids, a clear advantage, as I said, for the um, organic products above the conventional. Um, there is another group of fatty acids, the so-called omega-6 fatty acids. It is not that they are really bad. They are as well, um, and they as well have their, um, their functions in our bodies and we need them, but we have them too much of them in our diets. And also most of our farm animals have too much of them in our diets. This is why we shortly say, okay, what we want is omega-3 and what we would not want is omega-6. And you see for the omega-6 fatty acids, we have the advantage, so the, the higher um, concentrations in the dairy products from conventional production. The same study looked also at vitamins. And you see here, again, an organic advantage for tocopherols, that is vitamin E, and for carotenoids, that is vitamin A. And um, uh, from the perspective of organic products, um, some disadvantage um, for minerals in these dairy products. And if we now go into the detail of their analysis, then they could link it not only to organic or conventional, but to the diet. In this plot, um, you see um, the relationship between feeding um, uh, characteristics. And this uh, you see here, the GA means grass, fresh grass intake, and the GS means uh, grass silage. And we have here on the other side of the plot, hay or straw, and here um, concentrates. 
and everything that is on the same side with something is correlated positively. So correlated with the grass intake and somehow with the um, grass silage are the N3, the omega-3 fatty acids. And correlated with the opposite with the concentrate-rich diets are the omega-6 fatty acids. Absolutely not surprisingly, but it is nice to have it in um, such a plot uh, 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 through so many studies that were analyzed. And we also see this positive relation uh, with uh, grass intake of beta carotenes, which is here, and of natural um, uh, vitamin E isomers, tocopherols, which is here. So we have a very clear influence of forages, of fresh forages on the fatty acid profiles, a positive influence, a, a desired influence, and also on the um, lip um, lipid uh, vitamins E and A. And just to uh, mention the whole picture, so the same group of authors, they published this one meta-analysis about milk dairy products, and they also uh, produced a meta-analysis about meat products with more or less the same result. And so, um, Beyond the question of organic or conventional, we could see here that uh, the grass-based nutrition was um, the point that matters. And therefore, I think the titles of these um, uh, studies are a little bit misguiding because um, the difference is the nutrition. And, and I, as well, can gain the same um, amounts of uh, desired fatty acids if I would have a grass-based uh, system in a conventional system. Just uh, because I don't know what is the, oh, I didn't know what is the whole auditory here today and uh, to be all on the same page, what we are talking about, I wanted to introduce very shortly about um, these fatty acids because um, I will stress a little more on them. What is a saturated fatty acid? It is a straight one which has all um, the, hydrogen uh, bonds um, in its chain. And the unsaturated fatty acids are lacking of hydrogen at certain places. So we have here the um, monounsaturated oleic acid, and we have the polyunsaturated fatty acids with several double bonds where we are missing one uh, hydrogen atom. And um, so they are really, really unsaturated. So they are quite hungry to the British of you who um, can understand this. And um, these, um, within these um, highly unsaturated fatty acids, we find this um, 18.3, and this is the alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3 basis I was talking about. And if we look at their functions, so we have on the saturated side, um, the straight molecules, which are packed very densely. So lipids of saturated fatty acids, they are often crystalline. They are very dense. They have a clear structure function. They have a depot uh, function in the body. And they, um, yes, they are crystalline. So we can make a candle out of them. And other, on the other hand, um, the unsaturated fatty acids, they are bent at certain places. Um, therefore, um, um, lipids containing many unsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids. They are fluid, they are oils, and they have in the metabolism, in the body, process functions. And if we look a little bit more into detail, so we have for the omega-3 fatty acids, very important function in the genesis of the nervous system in the function of the nervous system antioxidative functions we have and again neural membrane functions or in all in all cell membranes we need these um, unsaturated fatty acids and they have an important function also in inflammatory processes so we can say grass-based ruminant products are rich in omega-3 fatty acids and they make smart and they make healthy and they even keep uh, bring a goat to the ability to read a book and we also have these vitamins A and E. And again, the vitamin A may help the um, 
the go to see the lettuce. And um, we have, again, the antioxidant, anti-stress, and immune system functions of these vitamins. So again, grass-based ruminant products are healthier. And the next step is the question, or is, is my statement again, they, this is related to biodiversity. And the question is, how is it related to biodiversity? Once more, um, these are fatty acids we find in plants, in feed plants. And um, so the highest concentration um, um, is on the side of the unsaturated fatty acid. Again, we have here the linolenic fatty acid, which is with 70 to 80% in grasses, for instance, the most abundant fatty acid. Um, a, an eating, a grazing ruminant can eat. So all the lipids from the plants um, a ruminant usually eats bring a large amount, a large proportion of omega-3 linolenic acid. While, for instance, my silage or wheat or also soybean, which I forgot to mention here, have very low um, concentration in linolenic acid. But they um, have higher uh, concentrations in omega-3 fatty acids. And this is re the reason why the concentrates, as I showed earlier, matter in this balance of omega-3 and omega-6. And to go into a detail and to uh, come closer to the question why biodiversity matters, I show you a very old um, experiment of mine, which we conducted here in the Swiss mountains many years ago, where we compared three groups of cows. Some, uh, the blue ones, had only silage and concentrates in barn the whole season. The yellow ones had fresh grass, but fed in barn and no concentrates. And the green ones had fresh pasture all the time. And you see the linolenic acid concentrations in the lipids of the milk are clearly higher in the cows that uh, eat, that, that hate, uh, uh, that received grass. So here, um, all the question is answered and I can close my talk. We have um, um, a clearly higher amount of um, omega-3 fatty acids in milk from cows that had grass. But we even had um, situations where the difference was much higher. And they, these situations differed by the type of pasture. So we had here during a lowland pasture uh, phase already an impact during a highland pasture or a highland pasture grass phase, a very high impact on the omega-3 fatty acid concentrations. And I will um, more and more explain the reasons why it was so, but here, just to make, make it clear, uh, we have these differences and we have even a little better effect for the cows grazing compared to those who received almost the same grass, but in barn. And just to say already now, the biodiversity in terms of number of species abundant was um, three times as high in the highlands or four times as high compared to the lowland. Another picture about uh, lamp tissues, sheep tissues um, of sheep uh, that had grazed lowland pastures or um, upland pastures. Again, we see for comparing the lowland pasture to the alpine pasture sheep, we see that with the alpine pasture, linolenic acid in meat, in heart muscle, in lung tissue and fat tissue is always higher for the sheep from the alpine pasture, while the alpha linolenic acid in their feet was higher in the lowlands than on the Alps. And here we now see that the linolenic acid contents in the product are not a direct function of the linolenic acid in the feed. What I already added here is that the phenolic compounds in the feed were much higher in the alpine pastures than in the lowland pasture. And again, missing here, also the biodiversity was much higher in the alpine forages than in the lowland forages. So if we look at what our ruminants are eating. We have 
like um, <laughs> grasses, forages um, with more or less choice. Um, we have concentrates that bring um, concentrated energy or protein into the diet. Um, we try in intensive barn-based feeding for high-yielding cows to bring with an optimal mixture of for forages and concentrates, the nutrients, the energy and the protein side into optimal balance to force these cows to give us 9, 10, 11,000 kg per year. But what we are uh, ignoring very often in um, animal nutrition theories are the plant secondary compounds like I already mentioned, um, the phenolic compounds, which are present in fruits, in herbs and shrubs, and in woody material that is also consumed by animals, um, like we see on this nice photo from the Stara Planina. Um, so ruminants eat grass, legumes, herbs, mycelage, concentrate, and they get carbohydrates energy, they get lipids with the, uh, as an energy provider, but also with the metabolic functions I already mentioned. They receive protein with uh, the specific functions. But also the plants provide secondary compounds. And this is terpenes. This is phenolic compounds, including, for instance, tannins. This is glucosides. These are alkaloids. And these have good and bad um, properties. So we have anti-nutritive effects like intake inhibition or like anti-digestive um, effects or toxic effects of all these secondary compounds. But we also have positive effects like antiparasitic, antioxidative, antimicrobial, and um, here it gets uh, to be interesting. And we have modulative effects at the rumen and the ruminal digestion, um, uh, digestive and um, um, the, the whole rumen functions. We have potential protein protection in the rumen. We have a potential protection of fatty acids in the rumen and regulation of all the rumen fermentation. And we have, of course, manifold endogenous functions of these plant secondary compounds. And this is why we have spices and teas in our human diets, uh, because we use the same endogenous functions of plant secondary compounds. We find these compounds in flowers, in leaves, in roots, in fruits and seeds, and so on. In many parts of plants, which are selected and consumed by ruminants, if they have the chance to do so. Once more, our fatty acids. And um, I want to highlight here that when the ruminant eats the linolenic acid, it will be by the, ruminal, uh, by the rumen microbiota to a very large degree saturated and brought into the direction of saturated, uh, for instance, stearic acid. So from the process side to the structure side, this is what rumen microbiota do with um, uh, dietary fatty acids for the ruminant. So if the ruminant eats a plant, it eats omega-3 fatty acids, but it also eats plant secondary compounds if the plant is a fresh herb, for instance. And the omega-3 fatty acids are, as I said, to a very large degree, to above 90%, 95 to 99%, they are saturated in the rumen. So they are lost for the organism of the ruminant itself. And they are also lost for the milk of for the meat we want from them. And only 1% to 5% of the eaten, of the ingested linolenic acid reach the blood and can potentially go to milk or to tissue. So this is what uh, happens to omega-3 fatty acids in the rumen. But the secondary compounds may have a protection function for these fatty acids in the rumen. So there is plenty of evidence of 
in vitro and in vivo evidence that plant secondary compounds, especially tannins, are able to protect fatty acids in the rumen of the ruminant from being um, saturated to a too large degree. And I have here a slide that says the same as I just said, so I won't spend too much time on explaining it again. Um, and this is one of many fold studies of ours and many, many studies of many colleagues um, that show yeah, phenols, phenolic compounds, tannins are able to protect omega-3 fatty acid from the loss in the four stomachs of ruminants. And this is very important. It is also important, we can imagine it must have been very important uh, for the evolutionary um, 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 evolution of ruminants, because um, as we, they need omega-3 fatty acids, not only in their rumen, they need it endogenously. So if I go back to um, the experiments I already showed you, we have these sheep with the um, high omega-3 um, uh, concentrations in their tissues from alpine pasture compared to lowland pasture. And if we relate it with the fennels in the feeds, then we have a clear linear positive relationship between phenolic compounds in the feed they had, so in, in the pasture they grazed, and the omega-3 fatty acid in the adipose tissue, or for instance, in the longissimus dorsi, so in the muscle tissue. This is one of examples where we see what matters is not the linolenic acid in the feed, but is um, the phenols, the, the tannins that protect the linolenic acid in the rumen. And this is also the solution um, um, uh, to the thing here. Again, we have in the high diverse, botanically diverse alpine pasture, we have a high biochemical diversity. We have higher concentrations of phenols and they protected the linolenic acid and this is why we find them in the milk. Um, nice to say, because we have here um, in the auditory, the uh, leader of the INTECT um, European project and just um, INTECT found um, across Europe in a large array of, of dairy samples or of beef samples, I think, um, exactly the same difference between intensively produced products and mountain produced products and with these concentrations of omega-3 fatty acids um, in the product. So this is not only a Swiss specificity, we find these differences and this um, um, multitude, uh, 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 so in this uh, size uh, across Europe. And what I want to derive from this is the following um, idea, what we see doing the cow here is something we not really expect from her if she's an agricultural member of production because she's not eating as much as possible but she is exploring and she's choosing she's choosing between um, quite some offer of different plants and different plant parts she is selecting what she needs as uh, this is my hypothesis, she's selecting for or against plant secondary compounds. She's of course also selecting for nutrients, but this, the secondary compounds she needs to control the processes in her rumen. She is balancing between two environments, the plant environment, which is her outer feed environment and um, the microbial environment, the, um, the ecosystem in her rumen. And the highest, like uh, the highest conscious instance in this interplay between plant environment and rumen microbial environment is the, the, the level of consciousness of the ruminant. So the choices of the ruminant must have been very, very strongly um, um, selected in evolution for an optimal choice of those antimicrobial compounds and those amounts of antimicrobial compounds that allow for controlling the microbiota in the rumen 
without destroying it. And this is a very specific ability. I am, um, I am convinced um, a ruminant animal must have very strongly because it must have optimally developed through evolution. Otherwise, they would have died out um, by their own rumen that would have, for instance, um, destroyed their um, intake of omega-3 fatty acids. How could they develop a nervous system? How could they develop the nervous system? How can develop the nervous system of the embryo in a cow if the cow is not able to um, if the cow is not able to protect the essentially necessary omega-3 fatty acids and vitamins and so on from destruction from saturation in the rumen? So this ability to control must be related with the ability to make the right choice. And because all these substances may be toxic, um, the choice is also avoidance. And the choice has a lot to do with the dosage. The dosage makes the poison. And in, to come back to agricultural sizes, to agricultural um, scales, of course, this behavior is not what the cow has to do every hour and every minute of a day. We are also not eating oregano just like oregano. We are eating a pizza with a very lot of um, carbohydrates and a very lot of protein. And then we have the oregano like the spice on top. And this gives us the, for instance, antioxidant functions um, we developed <laughs> to eat uh, and to include uh, into our cultural diets. So if we talk about these secondary compounds, we talk about we talk about the spices in the diet of uh, these animals, but we should not forget about them. And they are related to biodiversity. They are related to the botanical diversity, which, which brings along the biochemical diversity. And out of this, my take is, if the animal is able to make these choices, and if these choices are very likely to be very, very deeply and very, uh, um, how to say, very anciently rooted in their evolution. Um, these ability are most probably related to needs. And again, here the picture of the uh, uh, barn-fed cows with the total mixed ratio. Here we prevent them from having any choice because here we are giving them the perfectly balanced diet and we want them to eat it as it is to have the maximum milk yield but we don't give them any chance to have a choice to steer their own ruminal processes 10 minutes and, yeah and my take and I'm already I, I will have already difficulties to fill the 10 minutes my take um, is that um, it is a matter of animal welfare to give them these choices and to give them these like sensations about taste, about order, and about uh, uh, choosing for something and avoiding something. And maybe this was surprising for you that I ended um, with animal welfare. But again, if we take seriously what I said in the beginning about um, uh, the physiological functions of these omega-3 fatty acids for us. So it is very clear that um, we are mammals as the cattle as well. These functions are the same for the cattle. And, and if I feed the cow in a way to increase the omega-3 fatty acids in the milk, in the first uh, line, this will increase the omega-3 availability for her own tissues and um, for her embryo. And of course, milk is um, um, evolutionary, not meant for us, but for the calves. And 
maybe as a last physiological um, um, effect here in female mammals of all mammal species, there is a very high hormonal regulation um, during pregnancy or uh, gestation and during lactation to bring as much as possible of these functional fatty acids, for instance, uh, omega-3 fatty acids from the own tissues into the tissues of the embryo or into the milk. So there is a very high demand for these. And if we are trying to increase it for um, the, the tissues we want to consume, we increase it also for the animal itself and we do something good the health of the animals themselves. So my conclusion is based on a botanical diversity, for instance, on mountain pastures, but this here is not a mountain pasture. This is a lowland pasture you see here, right um, here at Fiebel in the Swiss so-called lowlands. <laughs> the botanical diversity brings along, along biochemical diversity. And this brings choice for the animal if we let them graze. This helps them to modulate their own metabolism and increases their health. And not the least, it leads to a healthy product. And the botanical diversity um, is uh, very clearly linked with a healthy ecosystem. The choice for the animal is linked with the happy cow, I hope, I suppose. And this all is linked um, with the healthy products we want to consume or we want to sell. So this is my conclusion. We have in ecosystems, we treat like ecosystems and we give a certain biodiversity. And if we give the cows or the sheep participation, of this biodiversity, but by not only um, um, uh, looking at it and finding it nice, but giving them opportunity to graze it. Um, I am convinced that we are here on the pathway to a One Health system, which probably has still lacks of description and where we probably have left quite a lot of open issues and questions we could do research on, be it on farm, be it on their own farm and practice, or be it in the institutions, and to describe the systems and produce something and develop something which is um, healthy for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? So from the chat, there is two questions from, from Walter. The first, Florian, maybe how do conventional farmers deal with the lack of omega-3 in the ratio, rations of cows? Um, and this, they, uh, OK. Sorry. So maybe for the first one, yes. Um, uh, usually they don't deal with it. So um, there is already considerations about omega-3 fatty acids and we may have some linseed in, in concentrates, for instance. Um, and But as we see in the difference between the milk products, we have this very low level of omega-3 fatty acids in conventional dairy products and we have the high in pasture-based. Okay, and they uh, give birth uh, to living calves with brains, uh, the conventional cows as well. So this may be a point against my theory. However, on the other side, did we really do enough research on the question um, where the uh, inflammations of the mammary gland, inflammations of um, the um, uh, reproductive tract or of the claws, all these, um, all these 
uh, metabolic diseases um, cows in intensive systems are suffering from, whether this is at least partly related to lack of, for instance, omega-3 fatty acids or vitamins. We don't know this. There is, to my knowledge, there are not sufficient um, um, epidemiological studies um, who could show um, an evidence for or against uh, such a theory. Uh, second point is, did we really um, contest calves from um, from pasture systems against uh, calves from intensive systems about their smartness? Thanks a lot. There is another question from Olivier Hugna um, about the large difference between fresh grass and I think also silage and hay observed in the meta-analysis. Is that about the transformation of secondary metabolic during the drying or less possibility to select or is this both of this process? Um, I think it is both. Yeah. I, I think uh, the less possibility of selection um, is, um, for instance, in my example um, with this uh, Alpine experiment where we did not feed um, conserved but fresh forage in the barn, then selection is the only plausible explanation for the difference. Lack of selection in the barn compared to the pasture si situation. But also, um, um, we know that um, quite some secondary compounds suffer from um, drying processes. And uh, we know that quite also, um, uh, also fatty acid patterns to some degree and also um, compounds are um, changed during ensiling processes, for instance. So um, there is um, there is quite some um, like uh, biochemical changes from um, uh, from fresh to conserved forages, but to be honest, um, I am still not able to say um, this exactly. This or this is here the point, but we see it again and again that um, uh, conserved uh, so grass silage or hay may already bring an advantage, but then the pasture situation. Um, increases the advantage um, significantly. Thanks a lot. There is a, one question of one of the Lucy. Are there any studies assessing the risk of digestion disease of cattle based on the type of the diet? For example, ratio of concentrate low drivers, grass, diet, um, Diverse, diverse grass diet, high diversity grass diet. So I think it's. To my, it's yeah, really yeah, I, 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 I didn't to know. my knowledge, uh, not. But it may be that there are now studies. I am. I may be not aware of because, um, as I told you, I had quite um, some years. Um, uh, after my last um, research on these topics, and I didn't start a um, 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 uh, literature search right yesterday to figure this out. So maybe there is, but um, at least not prominent enough um, that it came to my knowledge. <laughs> but I think this is what we have to do to make such, study, such studies. Yeah. We have also one comment from Yanka. Very inspiring presentation. Thank you. It will seem that, that the future of high nature value farming system is bright, but it needs a lot more communication of this type of research to make it to prioritized system. We all know it being more and more marginalized. Do you have a uh, comment on it? I can only agree, yes. Um, this is our very big challenge and um, on, on many levels, it is our challenge how to bring these um, areas and these regions um, with all their qualities back into, um, into valorization. 
So there is also one comment to this point. Do you think that it has been sufficiently communicated to policymakers that decide on important subsidies? I can answer this only for Switzerland, where I think, yes, this is um, quite um, uh, common knowledge here uh, in, on the policy level, I think. Um, how it is in other mountain regions in Europe, whether there is enough policy awareness, I don't know. But I am always a little bit skeptical how uh, how large is um, the political effect and how much is market. And um, our failure of all of us is um, um, to address the market power and the market functions in the proper way, I think. So my take would be uh, we have somehow um, to, um, to go the market way. So it's one related comment from Andy Lucher. It is allowed to advertise uh, for higher healthiness in the market. And are there differences among, among countries? Again, I can only answer for Switzerland. And in Switzerland, it is not allowed to make any health claims on um, uh, ruminant products <laughs> because ruminant products contain quite a lot of saturated fatty acids for the reasons I mentioned. And there is, in Switzerland, in the land of Jesus, um, there is um, kind of a public health um, uh, um, awareness that dairy products cause heart attacks. And this is so very briefly said. And this is why we should not um, uh, claim any health claims on dairy products or on, on ruminant products. I don't know how it is on the European level. I think in Germany, there was advertisements, there was labels like heart cheese um, based on, on uh, grass milk in southern Germany. So um, obviously in Germany, it, it is possible, yes. Um, I have also one question. Uh, you said that it's rooted in evolution by cows, this, this whole process. And one of the last slides you had um, Holstein cows and one other breed. And my question would have been, um, are there any studies on the difference different breeds regarding this um, this pattern um i just tried to to um share my screen once more yeah. um so these are not holstein cows um, um these are swiss flag fee cows um but um the uh, previous so one the, uh, where, maybe where previous. Ah, yes, the yes 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 in the barn and, yeah yeah right so here is a very interesting study from Switzerland as well, from Agroscope, um, that I, I can't uh, explain now the graph in detail, but um, the, um, it is exactly um, um, the message of this um, publication is that there are gen genotypic um, breed differences in the choice preferences of um, cows on these same high alpine mountain pastures. Um, so yes, we have these differences. And it is um, as expected that the highland cattle are, so the, the, the most robust cattle are, um, how to say, most tolerant um, um, to, the, to a broad array of plants. And that the, um, um, that the high, higher developed uh, breeds are more, how to say, picky. Uh, one question of of Walter. I, you probably know the the Swiss grass mixture for lace. The, for example, the standard mixture. Do you think that they meet the cow standards if they can be grazed? Um, 
this is very difficult to say because in order to um, know um, uh, uh, to to get this um, the cows standards or the cows requirements clearer, um, I think we still need a lot more of research of behavior research. So selection behavior of cows in these different uh, situations. And what you see here on my picture is a, um, indeed um, a, an experiment we have here at Feeble or we had here at Feeble the past two years where we produced our own um, seed mixtures and uh, with different proportions of uh, different herbs compared to grass, clover and only grass. Um, where we try to follow their um, um, selective behavior to figure out what is it, what they are looking for, and when is it that they are looking for something or avoiding something. And um, uh, frankly speaking, and this is the weakness of my theory that it is so complex um, and the functions are so complex. And um, also uh, the whole system and um, so um, the functions we expect from the cows within the agriculture make it not easier but more complex that it is uh, at the moment I think very difficult to say what um, really satisfies these needs because we don't even and we aren't even able to quantify the needs in the right way it is to me it is a pathway of looking differently to um, ruminant nutrition than we did, but we are in the very beginning. But nonetheless, I think, yes, um, we have quite some um, um, herb-rich uh, um, standard mixtures in Switzerland, um, which I find <laughs> um, pretty good, but I'm still not, anyway, not the cow who's eating it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any other that... questions? We have, uh, if we have any more question, we have time for one more, and then I think we should uh, wrap up soon. We have one more from another Lucy. Thank you for the presentation. Can you differentiate for this positive effect between grazing on mixed species sward and grazing on high nature grassland? No, I can't because um... Well, my my theory is that um, it is um, the diversity on the one hand, and then um, the level of secondary compounds on the other that matters. And of course, due to uh, stress factors on the mountains, um, the mountain pastures have quite a high level of secondary compounds in this woods. And um, on on richer soils, um, the situation is quite different. Um, and therefore, it is uh, much more difficult to uh, establish um, multi-species swords on richer soils, as we all know. So, of course, um, there are um, um, linkages between um, uh, kind of be, be, between the site and um, the swords. But nevertheless, I I don't think that it is altitude because we can also have stress factors and poor soils um, in lower um, regions. So it is not uh, it is not bound to mountain pastures. It is bound to the question of intensity of um, of the swords related to the soils, related to the nutrients and so on. And I'm not saying we should not make intensive forage production. As I said, I'm talking about spices. Thanks a lot. I don't you. know, Florian or Janka, do you have a concluding remark? Or Janka, do you have any answer that you need? Uh, <laughs> yes, actually. Um, and I think we also got uh, a lot uh, uh, a lot more questions to look into uh, in the future, but then uh, quite positive um, results to communicate uh, for the products from the region. But then, the, as I uh, wrote in my comment, 
but these systems, the extensive grazing in the difficult conditions, which are the important ones for the uh, health of the animals and then for the product, are being more and more marginalized. So I completely agree with Florian that we have to um, explore the market opportunities. But I would also add that the policy um, regulations and support are equally important because when policy makes these systems marginal, then it's very difficult for the market to respond to that. So uh, a great uh, presentation, Florian. Thanks a lot for that. And uh, Julie and Andy and all the team for organizing the uh, webinar because it's really, really useful. Thank you. Thank you. I Florian. agree. I agree, Yanka. Yeah. Thank you, Florian. Thank you all. Um, it was my pleasure. And um, yeah, I, I would have liked to see you all <laughs> to talk to you, but another time. So Thank we you. are doing a co innovation workshop in Switzerland in May. So maybe if you have any possibility to join. Okay. So okay. thank you. Thank you Goodbye. so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.